Hello everybody, welcome to Ham Radio DX. I'm Hayden, VK7HH, and we've got a very special live stream for you today. I better just mute myself so I don't hear, hear myself echoing. We've uh, yeah got a very special live stream today. I've got a, uh, a, a guest that I've uh, been looking forward to on the show for quite some time, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that uh, very shortly. I just want to do a shout out to uh, my channel members. I uh, very much appreciate your support of the channel and uh, for helping uh, with uh, everything that you do. If you haven't already, uh, there's a join button below that you can do to join the Ham Radio DX channel and you can uh, become a, uh, a channel member. Uh, please like and uh, subscribe also if you haven't already done so. So we would like to introduce John Armadeo, AA6JA. I'll just bring John in. Here we are. AA6JA, producer of the hit show Last Man Standing, now in its ninth and final season. How are you, John? I'm great. Uh, it's great. Thanks for having me on the show, and it's good to meet you virtually like everyone else these days. <laughs> it, uh, it's certainly becoming a, a normal occurrence, isn't it? Serious. It's uh, it's It's been quite a... Uh, I think I contacted you a couple of years ago to, uh, to get you on the show, and obviously uh, due to your busy schedule, it was uh, difficult, but I really appreciate you taking the time now to uh to catch up it's uh it's been great to finally meet you and to uh to have a chat about the the wonderful show that is last man standing well thanks yeah i i, I remembered um your email and I, I think at the time i i sort of honestly said i don't really have too much to talk about in the ham radio world you know we were just starting up and just uh, trying to wedge ham radio into the show in some way and we, I don't think we even knew what that was going to mean for us and um you know, I think if your viewers have seen the show, there's a tiny little bit. It's really not a show about ham radio, but it, it's got a little ham radio thread in it, um, probably more in the background than the foreground. But then um, because the show's ending and because we thought rather than just uh, pull up stakes and leave, we would have a special event to commemorate that uh, our nine seasons of television. And it occurred to me that, you know, maybe you're still interested in talking about the show and uh, at least at this point, I have something to say about it. <laughs> well, we were just saying uh, before the show started that, yeah, it is uh, one of my uh, favorite shows. And uh, it, it went, when I realized that Ham Radio was going to be featured, uh, I was quite interested to see how that was going to be worked into a primetime sitcom. So it was uh, it was a very good way that you that you did that. And you mentioned about the background. That's what my background <laughs> is at the moment is the, uh, yep. is the station. I'll, we, we will show some photos later on, but uh, it's quite yep. a, a good setup that you've got going on there. Thank you. That's the current season nine uh, station, which although you're blocking it, it more importantly for the icon people for Ray, that that's an IC 7,300 and an IC 9,700. Thank you, Vanna White. And um, we've had different radios every single year. Um, we, it, once we started Ham Radio in season one, we would uh, these radios are on loan. We don't get to keep them, unfortunately. And at the end of each year, we send them back, and, and they send us the next thing that you know they're trying to. I guess that they're trying to sell. But it's worked out for us really well because we've always had some amazingly cool radios on the show. Just a quick comment that we've seen in the chat here, and uh, look forward to everyone putting their comments in the chat. DW3CPW is uh, is uh, joining us from the Philippines and says, G'day, everyone. So uh, great to have you watching today. So um, we've got some questions, and we'll go through uh, some, some of your time on the set, but I just wanted to go back before uh, when you first started in amateur radio, and what sort of sparked your interest in that, and... and uh, when were you licensed? Um, I was licensed in 1978, which is quite a while ago. Um, I, you know, radio wasn't the, the first thing. I was fascinated with, with electronics, just purely electronics uh, of all kinds and shapes. Like a lot of your viewers probably, you, we took things apart. Sometimes we could put them back together, not often. And um, I was also a guitarist, so I was playing with electric guitars and amplifiers and tape recorders. Really particularly enjoyed uh, tape recorders and, and very early uh, video recorder. I had a reel-to-reel -reel black and white video recorder. So that was all just playing with electronics and that kind of technology. Um, a friend, um, well, really two friends, an old, the older brother, Kevin, who was a friend of mine, and his dad, was a ham. So we were introduced to ham radio through Kevin's dad. And then his younger brother, Stephen, uh, both of which are hams now. Stephen waited a few more years, but he got his license. 
And, um, you know, we played with CB radio too, of course, like everyone did back then in the, I guess that was the seventies. Um, and CB of course is the gateway drug to ham radio, because when you want to be able to do more stuff with radios and get further and have more power and all of that stuff, you, you got to go to ham. And we did that. So I got my license in 78. Uh, I was what we called back in the United States, a tech plus, which meant you took the general exam, but no code. And then a year later, I went back and took the code and got my general, either the 13.5 words per minute code, and got a general license. And I kept that license through all of the years. When I uh, started to, put, to try to put ham radio into Last Man Standing, it made sense to me to upgrade to extra, which I did about, I guess, about 10 years ago now, since the show's been on the air for 10 years. Yeah, um, uh, one thing that stood out when you just said there is that it usually ends up being uh, some sort of family member that introduces us to ham radio. It's, I know yeah. in my case it was the same thing. It was uh, my my uncles introduced me to the hobby, and and um, it's uh, it is a it is a lifelong hobby. We said also backstage that it's it's not a it it's not as popular as it probably could be, <laughs> and that's why I think it was important that. Uh, in the show that you produce that you know it does get some sort of exposure which mm -hmm. I think is a is a great thing which will um, which we can uh, we go into and so with with your being licensed so long what's some of your passions in amateur radio and, and what do you specifically enjoy about the hobby you know it's funny I, I really enjoy building stations um, maybe even more than operating you know uh, mm -hmm. part of it is just the I guess it goes back to what I said about childhood. It's about electronics and about building things and making them work and uh, making a complex station work well, making an antenna tuned extremely well. I'm, all of my antennas are pretty much flat SWR. And if they're not, I just keep working on them until they are, you know, and uh, same thing at the, at the, at the studio. Um, when guest operators come and they're using our studio, they're usually, they usually rem remark that uh, our antenna systems are extremely well done. And that's, that's part of the hobby for me to make those things work. And then on the operating side, because my time is limited, like everybody else in ham radio, we have to work for a living that I'll usually get on the radio on Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings, where, you know, if there's nothing else going on. But uh, I don't have too much time to allocate to operating. So I guess uh, I, I spend more time building and tweaking and a little less time operating than maybe most. Uh, but th that's the fun part of the hobby for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that sometimes, as you say, uh, building something and making it work is a lot more fun than actually using it. <laughs> like the, it be, yeah. you, you mentioned about SWR. I have the exact same thing. I'll I'll tune a, an antenna, but I just like it to be absolutely perfect. You know, get all the SWR as low as possible and <laughs> make sure that it's all working. So, yeah, that's uh, that's great. And one one of the things that I noticed that you do or you have done is encourage a lot of people to take their amateur license as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess that that's also something that you enjoy doing is helping new hams get on the air and, and take their tests. Yeah, I do. In fact, you know, when we started the show and we started to, to talk about ham radio, it's not really very hard on a show because you have a lot of technical people, you know, like video people, audio people. So right off the bat, we had a number of licensed amateur radio operators. Um, but then there was this, this large group of, you know, younger kids that uh, are in the clerical sort of stuff, production assistants and those kinds of things. And um, they have a lot of time on their hands. The TV show takes a long time. They don't get, they don't have to do much, but they have to wait while we're shooting. So I thought it would be better for them to learn something that might be useful for them in their life than to just sit in front of their computers, downloading music illegally or texting their friends all day. <laughs> so we proposed that, that if uh, anybody that wanted to get a license, we would get them the materials, help them, you know, with uh, questions. And then give anyone that got a license got a handheld radio out of the deal, and uh, a lot of us, a lot of took, a lot of them took us up on it. We, I think we maxed out pretty much at about 35, 36 operators, but of course the show has come and gone over the years. If you know the story of Last Man Standing, we were produced by 20th Century Fox, but we aired on the ABC Television Network in the U.S. Um, and then of course ABC eventually canceled us after six years, and then Fox picked us up, Fox Network picked us up, and we were produced by Fox Studio. And then Disney bought the Fox Studio. So where we land is exactly the opposite of where we started. We're now a show produced by Disney that airs on the Fox Network instead of the other way around, which is how it started. So it's very funny. But anyway, 
a lot of the kids took us up on it. We printed out the question pool. I, I usually print out a question pool with only the correct answers so that people aren't exposed to the wrong answers. We read through it every day at lunch. We let kids answer questions. And uh, I, I think that they learned a lot. I think they were surprised by, you, you know, I don't think younger people really ask how things work. You know, if you ask a, a young person how a cell phone works, they will say simply, it's a telephone. And you go, you know, actually not. It's actually a radio. It's actually several radios. And they're marvel at that. And you explain through it and they have a better understanding of how those things work. You know, so try to explain propagation to a 20 year old. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the uh, younger um, amateurs that got their license on the show, who also starred on the show as well at one mm -hmm. point, was uh, Jet Jurgensmeyer, who I did interview probably, oh, it's probably about two years ago now mm -hmm. um and he mentioned that uh, and, and the way that he he mentioned it was actually quite good he said that it's like the um and i think you you might have even used this in the show it's like the original social media platform yeah. uh, where you can make friends on the radio and 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 sort of lifelong lifelong friends as well yeah. so um he uh, he summed it up quite well uh, i thought um in that jet, regard so jet took to it really well he he really wanted his license he and his dad took it together at the same time as another uh, young production assistant in my office, and they all passed. And we arranged for both Jet and his dad to have uh, ICOM ID51 handhelds. And I got a call. He, he he got on the radio the minute his license, the minute his call sign came through, and started talking to hams on local repeaters. Um, so he'd go in the parking lot in between scenes of the show, and start working hams from the parking lot. And of course, you know he's a bit of a celebrity, so he'd get a little pile up even on a repeater. And then I'd get a frantic call from him or his dad. It's like, Jet's battery's dying. What do we do? It's like, so I run down there with the batteries from my handhelds and pull the hand, pull the batteries off Jet's father's handheld so that we could keep him going. And, you know, he just would run battery after battery. And then luckily we'd have to go back into the stage and shoot a scene so we could put him back on a charger. But he, he really <laughs> loved him radio. Oh, that's great. Um, so the next question I had, and and obviously um, we've we've got the last man standing amateur radio club, which we'll speak about. Uh, there's a special event coming up for that soon. But um, are you a member of any other uh, clubs of of note that you'd like to speak about? Well, that's true. I am, and in fact, that's how this event really came about. At least at the size that it is right now. I was thinking that maybe we would do a one day, maybe two hour event on HF and let some of our fans that want to contact us that haven't had the opportunity to, to get our QSL card before we go out of business, so to speak. And um, I'm a member of, of two clubs on the East Coast, because I come from the East Coast of the United States, um, the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club. That's a club on Long Island where I'm from. And um, when I visit uh, Long Island, which I do every se every year, um, I usually stop in and say hi to the club members, and my brother's a member of that club, and a, a very good friend who's unfortunately a silent key now was a member of that club. And um, Lou and Sally, who are two club members at GSB, um, who run the 12 Days of Christmas event, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Uh, it's It may be more an American event, but they have a number of operators around the country that are each designated one of the letters of the 12 days of Christmas, like pipers piping, drummers drumming. So there'd be like a K2D, K2P, that kind of thing. And they run that for a full week. So when I, I had mentioned we were doing this event to one of the great South Blake club members, in fact, I think the vice president, and he had Sally and Lou contact me to say that, you know, we know how to run events like that. And if you're interested, we'll help you do it. Of course, I'm really busy right now. So I took them up on it. Um, but one of the things they wanted to do was they thought a two hour event was just not gonna fly with the fans of Last Man Standing. So they proposed that it be a week long event, which it is now a week long event. And um, there are, I think at the moment we have in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 guest operators that will be KA6 LMS something, KA6 LMS slash zero through nine. Those are the US uh, operating uh, areas and bonus stations like K2L, K2S, K2, K2M, K2S, and W2, L, M, and S as bonus stations. And then at the same time, we'll have operations on all the digital modes, D-Star, DMR, Yesu System Fusion, uh, but also things like Echolink and Hamshack Hotline, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the AmateurLogic.tv guys are doing a um, 
I think it's the 20, uh, Saturday the 27th in the United States, uh, a full uh, multi-mode QSO party for us. So th there's just so many ways into this event. Like if you're, if you're interested in uh, contacting our station, you will be able to do it. And even internationally, because you'll be able to come in through any digital mode you have or Echo Link, you know, even if you don't have a radio laying around. Um, and all of that, of course, is going to be on our website, which I'm sure we'll mention the, the address for that website at some point tonight. Yep. Yeah, that's um, and the uh, yeah, so th that's a very important um, event coming up, and I guess it's it's also going to be the last opportunity for someone to get a QSL card too from the mm -hmm. from the station. So one of the yeah. uh, one of the great things about working KA six LMS is the great QSL cards that you can receive from the set from working someone on the set. Yeah. Yeah. I think that people enjoy the fact that, and then it's, it's, of course, it's the background you're in front of right now. That is the set where Tim Allen does what we call the vlog. It's uh, Tim talking directly to the camera and usually telling a little bit about how he thinks life should be or, <laughs> or, or is, or isn't. And um, our operations on set were always during our dinner hour. So we would run in there and set up the equipment and usually videotape it. And then, uh, work a hundred stations or so for an hour and then tear it all out quickly. And within minutes of us leaving that stage, the actors were, were standing in front of those radios. And they're also the radios that you see every week if you watch the show. Um, so I think, you know, it's a little, it's a little cool thing to be able to contact those actual radios sitting right on the set with us. And in fact, they're, they're live all the time when we're shooting. If you're ever watching a rerun of Last Man Standing and you see the radios behind him, you'll notice signals on those radios because they're they're on the volumes turned down, obviously, but yeah. they're live in the background. And uh, I'm not sure if it's in, or it's not it's not prevalent in that photo, but mm. I'll show it in a later one. Is the sure. is the QSL card wall that yeah. uh, you could send in your QSL card and it would be displayed potentially on the wall uh, on set. Mm. So. Your we QSL did, we, card we, could get we, prime time attention. <laughs> it, yeah, a number of them have. We we rotated it out. Um, the, the you're in front of the season nine, which is this this current season, and because um, it, it's not a it's it's a known storyline. Like in in season eight, um, Ed, who's Hector Alessandro's character, who owns this chain of stores, actually gives the store over to Mike Baxter. So he, he goes from being a marketing vice president to actually the owner of the chain. And we thought, well, we'll probably make the office a little bit more formal. So we took all the QSL cards because they're, they're kind of, you know, messy and uh, lots of patchwork stuff in the background. But it, for years, um, a lot of hams had their QSL cards on primetime national television, which was pretty cool. Mm. Um, so, just we'll just take a quick break here, and just uh, there's are a couple of comments that are coming through in the chat. We've got Andy uh, Kelly who says hi Hayden and hi John uh, from his call signs two E zero R double We've also got uh, Connect VK as well says morning guys. Wild Cascader Radio says great guest today, so uh, thank you for for joining in. And uh, and they also say that's cool. I bet a lot of people enjoyed seeing their card on the wall. It uh, definitely would have been a real novelty thing. I unfortunately didn't uh, <laughs> send in my card. I should have sent it in earlier. But anyway. yeah, I would have put it up. And you know, at least to get it, you can see it when you go through the reruns. You'll see that the cards will change. There are some that stayed up the whole time. But I know people. Of course, now these days people have um, 4K TVs and 70 inch televisions, so they can actually read what's in the background. In the old days, you wouldn't have been able to see it. You'd almost be able to see uh, right down to the grid square or the uh, or the signal <laughs> report on the card. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, we've yeah. got uh, W6IKE, uh, who's also here, and uh, would like to welcome uh, a channel member, VK Radio Ham, uh, VK3 GEK. So, thank you for for joining in on the show. Um, so, what I thought I might do uh, while you were talking about that special event is we'll play the mm -hmm. video for the uh, promotion of the event and that will give some information as to uh, what's going to happen in the event. So, just bear with me while I cue this up. Oh, sure. Uh, it's such a complex event, I thought it needed an instructional video. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, we'll, we'll play that and um, then we'll, uh, we'll come back. Very good. 
If you're a fan of Tim Allen's TV series, Last Man Standing, you'll have a final chance to contact the show's amateur radio club station before it goes QRT. This is KA0XTT73. The week-long KA6LMS radio special event starts on March 24th at 0000 UTC and runs through 2359 UTC on March 30th. This will be an all-mode, all-band event. CQ, CQ, CQ. This is KA6, LMS, Alpha 6, Alpha 6. This is Kilo Alpha 6, Liam and Mike Sierra calling CQ, CQ. Fans will have the opportunity to work the bonus one-by-one stations, K6L. K6M, K6S, W6L, W6M, and W6S. Stations from every call sign area will operate as KA6LMS-0 through KA6LMS-9 and KA6LMS-VE, providing nationwide and international coverage. The remote operators are a virtual who's who of ham celebrities, contesters, and podcasters. Many will live stream their operations. Check spotting sites like DX Summit for pop-up operations on any day and at any time during the event week. We expect the on-stage radios to be in operation from the studio in California on Saturday, March 27th at 1800 UTC using 20 meters and on Sunday at 2200 UTC using 40 meters. If you're a fan of digital modes, Saturday, March 27th is your day. At 1700 UTC, KA6LMS will be using D-Star on Reflector 12 Alpha, hosted by the PAPA repeater system. At 1900 UTC, the D-Star action moves to Reflector 30 Bravo, hosted by Georgia D-Star. At 2300 UTC, AmateurLogic.tv will host the KA6 LMS Multimode QSO Party using All-Star, DMR, D-Star, NXDN, P25, Echo Link, Hamshack Hotline, Wires X, and Yesu System Fusion. For DMR users, in addition to the multi-mode QSO party hosted by AmateurLogic.tv on the evening of March 27th, you'll have six more opportunities to use that mode. DMR specialist Michael, AF6FB will operate as KA6 LMS on March 25th at 1800 hours and 2100 hours UTC. On March 27th at 1600 hours UTC. On March 28th at 2100 hours UTC. And on March 30th at 1800 hours and 2100 hours UTC. Please check the event webpage for talk group information. KA6 LMS QSL cards will be available for stations who contact the stage directly or through relay stations. Special event certificates, including clean sweep endorsements, will be available via download. The KA6 LMS radio event is sponsored by the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club's 12 Days of Christmas team and K2 Heroes teams. In association with AmateurLogic.tv, the Papa Repeater System, and Georgia D-Star. And of course, Last Man Standing and KA6 LMS have always been powered by ICOM. For more information, go to www.gsbarc.org slash LMS. Yes, yeah, so uh, <laughs> plenty of opportunity to uh, to contact the station there, uh, yes. John. So it's going to be a really good uh, week coming up in, uh, well, it's only a couple of weeks away it's, now. Yeah, so. it's, couple of, it's going to be, um, I don't know what to say about it. It's, it's I never, um, in my business, one has to manage their expectations. You really don't know who will jump in, but there will certainly be opportunities <laughs> that if yeah. somebody wants to, to work us, they should be able to find someone to work them. They will be all over the United States. Um, we do have some very big gun stations, by the way. So uh, it's not impossible that we will work, you know, well outside the U.S. borders. It'll really just depend on propagation and what the sunspots are doing on that particular mm. day. But the digital modes will work for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and things like Echo Leak means that anyone can just sort of join yeah. in and uh, and make contact. So exactly. and, and and the digital modes, D-Star and, and others. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So... Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, we might uh, move on now and we'll talk a little bit more about Last Man Standing. So tell us about your career as a producer and what your other roles have been on the show. Well, um, 
I've been in this business for a very long time. So I, I started, as you can see by the cheesy, the cheesy uh, editing in that, that I started as an editor. I used all of my promo skills with lots of special effects and sound effects. Um, but I did start as really a video engineer, audio engineer, and then moved into editing and from editing moved into uh, production, you know, first uh, as an associate director and then an associate producer and ultimately spiraled down into being a producer and then further down into being an executive producer. But uh, I've also directed and, and I've also edited professionally. So I, I sort of have a fairly broad background in the entertainment industry. Um, producing is a lot of fun because it's very challenging and there's no, you don't just do one thing, you're just doing everything. Um, as a producer on this show, I don't write the show, I don't act in the show, and I'm not directing currently, but I pretty much do everything else, the crew and the schedules and the budgets and basically making sure that everything gets where it needs to be on time and in place. And uh, what I think you could say what producers do is we take a conceptual thing like a script and we make it into a physical thing that people can actually watch on television. That's sort of our job. Um, I guess the, I don't know, I, I, it's hard for me to know your viewership and what shows of mine that they would know, probably very few. Um, probably the other most famous show that I produced was Arrested Development. And oh, yeah. I, I know that's a syndication. Would know. Yeah, would that, they, that show's it, quite popular here, yeah. <clears throat> okay, because that's, um, you, you know, the, the shows that I've done in the United States that maybe only lasted a year or two years or three years, they probably didn't make it into a syndication of a level where it would be international. But I know that Arrested did pretty well internationally, and I imagine it's also dubbed into a number of languages, which would be funny to see. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was a very challenging show and a lot of fun to do too. Yeah. And uh, 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 with streaming services now, we do have access to a lot more of these shows. So um, I mentioned backstage, especially Last Man Standing, I think Arrested Development may also be uh, on streaming. I'm not sure what service, probably. Um, yeah probably uh, one of the local ones here but uh, last man standing is now on disney plus in australia so you can watch the first eight seasons uh the ninth season's not available just yet but uh, i'm sure that once that wraps up it will be available on there so yeah it's um it's it's definitely a um uh, uh a great job that you've done with it anyway it's been you know it's been a pleasure because um the cast is great um the writers tended to change every couple of years, but I, I pretty much know who all these writers are. And at the moment, I, I think we're they're doing their best work. And the shows that we're producing in season nine are some of the best shows we've ever produced. Um, the, obviously there's a, there's a COVID factor. Um, and one of the things that that does is it, it tends to focus the show. And what I mean by that really is um, because we can't leave the stage and because we aren't building a lot of sets, everything seems to take place in more or less the family home, the living room, the kitchen of the family home, or the outdoor man's store. And quite frankly, when you when you reduce people's resources, it forces them to be more creative. So rather than having effects or stunts or silly things, it just makes the writers, you know, dig deeper and write really funny, clever things for the, for the actors to say to each other. So this is my one of my favorite years from an entertainment value standpoint, not necessarily from a producing standpoint, because it is difficult for us. You know, we're doing all the COVID things. We're uh, wearing face masks and shields and social distancing and all of that. It's tough on the actors because they, of course, cannot be protected that way. So um, all of us on the crew have to be that much more careful around them. Um, but so far, we're, we're doing well. We're uh, Monday and Tuesday, we start shooting the first of the last three episodes. And then uh, in that last production week, that's when this special event is happening. And in fact, the last day of the special event is the last day of shooting on the series. So you're right in, in pointing out that if, if someone ever really wanted to contact the station, this would be the best time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't say that that as a club, the Last Man Standing Amateur Radio Club is about 35 members, uh, past and present, of crew and some cast. Um, that we wouldn't ever get back on the radio um, under the club call sign because we'll have the club call and the club license for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But this will be the last time you can actually call the club and we'll be sitting in front of that desk that is behind you in your in your background. Yeah. And I'm sure like with a show like this that uh, the the fans – you know, it's it's sort of a, it could be a fan thing with the club continuing on and and the mm -hmm. and the call sign continuing on being for such a long time. And you mentioned uh, a thirty five um, 
a crew and two cast members who are mm-hmm. licensed amateurs. Did you want to just uh, elaborate on that a little bit and who they are? Sure. Well, you know, the, the thing about the ham radio aspect of our show is that it, it didn't come from me. And a lot of people think that because I have ham in my background that, that it did, but it didn't. Um, this came about because Tim Allen wanted uh, two things. First of all, he was interested in, in his character being a ham radio operator because it also goes to the aspect of his character being a survivalist and a hunting, camping, fishing kind of guy. But he also personally wanted ham radio in his life. He wanted to get his license and he wanted to learn more about how ham radio worked. So, you know, I knew right off the bat that that was in my background and I could I could make that happen for him, not only in terms of uh, helping him find the materials he would need to pass a test and get his license, which he did in uh, season three, maybe. I can't remember exactly. And then also, of course, from an equipment standpoint, um, having some connection now to ICOM, um, every year we've been able to put the latest, greatest ICOM equipment on the set and let our cast members and our crew members play with it. And Tim has radio stuff, and Tim loves technology, really of every kind. I mean, he's he's. Uh, if you've seen Home Improvement, I know that you mentioned that you liked Home Improvement, and of course, Tim, uh, as as uh, Tim Taylor had the craziest equipment one can have, you know, nuclear powered blenders and (laughs) jet powered lawnmowers and all that. So maybe that uh, slops over a little bit into his real life where he he likes the latest cell phones and cameras and and ham radio equipment. So it was sort of uh, an organic, natural thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, his his latest show with uh, Richard Kahn's uh, called Assembly Required, and it's the same Mm -hmm. thing. He's just building things, putting it back together and, and judging people on that. So yeah, that's, exactly. uh, it's quite an amusing uh, show to watch. But And um, actually going back to what you were just saying about this season, about some of the best shows um, uh, that you're producing this season, I know that for a personal favourite of mine is uh, the, the, I think it was the second episode of the season where you have the Mike Baxter, Tim Taylor crossover yeah. and you get this strange sort of parallel where you've got both characters in the same show at the same time talking to each other it's quite a, an amusing thing it was a fun show to do and um and odd i mean i think when when the script was written we were thinking how will we do this you know like could we make tim into tim taylor which of course would require us um removing 20 or 25 years from the current um yeah. tim allen which, you know, these days you can do if you're a feature film and you have $100 million, we're a television <laughs> show. We don't have that kind of budget. So I believe we settled on the fact that even even Tim Taylor would have aged and he would be roughly the same age as Mike Baxter. And that's that's where it went. And then, of course, there is still some really fun magic CGI in there where Tim is in the same scene with Tim. And, you know, we did that the way you, you, most of your viewers who are hams have enough electronic knowledge to know how we did that. It was mostly just split screens composited together in computers uh, probably pretty you know pretty easy to do these days harder to do in the past and if we were a, a big tv studio we would have had a 20 year younger tim allen but uh, we couldn't afford it so <laughs> but it was it was a very fun episode it was it was tim has admitted publicly he said it was weird for him to act with himself mm. and to see himself performing with himself on camera yeah. so but it was a very fun week that we had doing that show. And, and there have been a couple of nods to home improvement throughout the years on our show, and the, the fans really enjoy them. Yeah, I've, I've followed that uh, quite closely. You've had uh, Patricia Richardson and Richard mm-hmm. Kahn on before, and you've even had Jonathan Taylor Thomas uh, direct a couple of shows as well. So, And, and he also oh, yeah. he was also in a couple of episodes too. So. Yeah. Um, that was uh, that was good, and yeah, he directed a couple of uh, he did. episodes in the middle of the the show's run mm-hmm. as well. He did. It was it was fun. I had not met him before, um, and uh, you know, of course, he's still he's still a big famous guy. That everyone was so excited to have him, and of course, you know, in the pre COVID days, we have a live audience. When you hear the laugh track on the show, mm-hmm. it's not a canned laugh track as people want to think. It's two hundred you know fans of the show and fans of Tim Allen. <laughs> laughing about, uh, at the jokes and they were very receptive to having uh, JTT Jonathan Taylor Thomas as a guest star on the show and then we invited him to direct a couple of episodes because he's a good director and, and it was just nice to have him around you know it's like old home week mm. yeah no I really enjoyed those uh, those yeah. shows and I know um, and mentioning back about uh, Tim saying about 
it was strange that he was acting with himself in that Mike Baxter Tim Taylor show, and and I know that the constant question is always is there going to be a home improvement reboot? Well, I'm hoping anyway. So we'll see what happens. Maybe they can bring Mike Baxter to that show as well. <laughs> that would be very funny. The the, the flip side, um, you know, the, the, they just seem to be rebooting everything right now. It's funny. Every day I read the trades, and it's like. Is are there no new ideas? I guess not, because they're just rebooting every show from the past, which would be fine. I'm, I know that a Nostalgia home improvement, thing, it, I think. of course, yeah. yeah, the home improvement reboot would be very well received if they chose to do one. Yeah, but in this country, it was a very big show, um, was it? and and I think it would be well received. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to Tim's uh, uh, journey in amateur radio, so his call sign is KK six OTD, which I've just popped mm -hmm. onto the. Uh, I think that's correct. Anyway, that's so correct. I've, just po yeah. I've popped up onto the screen there. So, um, does uh, what's it, what's it like working with Tim? And and obviously, he's got a lot of interest in the latest technology and radio and mm -hmm. things. How often does he get on the air and and that sort of thing? You know, I don't I don't really track what he does when he's not directly in front of me. So I don't know, but I know he's, he's asked a number of questions that indicate he's on the radio and listening to the radio. Mostly I think D star actually, because he keeps his ID 51 with him in his, his, let's say his dressing room. In Tim's case, it's a, it's a large bus, you know, a large, uh, one of those star vehicles that you see in the, in TV shows and movies. Um, and, yeah, um, big. yeah, big RV. I mean, the show uses radio, not ham radio uses radio both on and off screen. We're on a, a big studio lot and we're spread out around the lot. The stage is in one place, our offices are in another. And there are a number of departments on a TV show. You know, you have your, your assistant directors that run the stage and then you have props and wardrobe and set dressing, all these departments. Um, and the way we communicate with each other is through radio. It's, you know, UHF, what we used to call business band. And I think they now call land mobile. Um, so in addition to the ham radio stuff going on, we're constantly on the radios all day long. And for Tim, because he has a very distinctive voice and because handheld radios carry outside the studio walls, I put him on DMR. So actually Tim uses a DMR radio all day long, uh, to communicate with the stage. And, um, in fact, when we met him, he had already been to a, a famous local ham radio store here in Southern California and uh, you know, looked at all the equipment and, and, and met the sales guys and all that stuff. So I think he had just come to us after seeing the ham radio gear. And when he said he was interested in ham radio gear, we said, "Oh yeah, we can we can make that happen for you." Mm -hmm. You know. And then of course I know that you, we had talked a little bit about uh, Jet and uh, how much Jet loves ham radio. And I, I think you know he's a great example of a young ham. And of course we're all the latest obsession right now is young hams, but. Getting him on the air was very fun and watching his reaction to it. Um, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time to make more hams on the show. It's, uh, if we had more seasons, we could probably make more hams. Mm. But uh, we did what we could. I think you've done a, an excellent job. It's uh, been a, a great thing. And I've seen many photos on social media of people holding up their uh, their license <laughs> outside of the last man standing yeah. set and, and proudly showing that off. So I think it's great. Um, yeah, we've got probably one of the, the coolest place to take your license exam was on the set of Hat, Last Man Standing. <laughs> I, I, I think so. I don't think that there's many uh, there's many others. That's for sure. Uh, there's a couple of questions and a couple of comments that have appeared in the chat. Uh, RV Nut says, "Is Tim Allen as nice of a guy as he seems?" He's he's very nice. Um, he, he is one of the busiest guys you can imagine. Um, he's an extremely professional guy. He's a, he's a consummate businessman. And he is managing um, his own production company. Um, he does our show. He, of course, pre-COVID, he does stand-up comedy almost every weekend. He does movies like Toy Story, obviously, and other things. Um, and he's a commercial guy. He does commercials. He does voiceovers. So his time is unbelievably limited. You know, we all think we're busy in our lives. I think I'm busy, but it doesn't compare to people like Tim, who, who's he's in demand and almost every minute of his day is, is uh, scheduled to, to be someplace and do something. And he's a family guy. You know, he's got he's got a wife and kids. So, um, you know, talk about busy and talk about, you know, do you have the time to do anything other than that? And, and he, he finds the time to, to still pick up a radio or pick up a, a camera and shoot some photographs and things like that. So um, it's been a great experience for me um, to be with you know, you talk about Tim, he's 
not just a television star. He's legitimately a movie star, starting with the Santa Claus and also Toy Story, but he's done other movies too. And he's a television star and he's one of a very small group of people that have had two television series that have had more than a hundred episodes. So, I mean, you're talking about Lucy and Mary Tyler Moore and, you know, those kinds of stars. Tim is in that uh, group of about six or eight stars that have had two shows that have lasted, you know, Home Improvement lasted eight years, Last Man Standing uh, lasted nine years. We're just shy of 200 episodes and uh, Home Improvement went beyond 200 episodes. So uh, there's some very serious talent there. And that's one of the things that makes our show so great. Yeah, I remember in the 90s, uh, Tim had the number one the number one TV show, the number one movie, and the number one book all in the mm-hmm. one week. So, yeah, yeah. he's uh, he's quite a big movie. He's quite yeah. a, he's, it, it seems like to me, it seems like he, that he's more humble than anything else. He's still a regular guy who just, you know, he knows just a, just a regular stand-up guy and, and he's done well mm-hmm. for himself. So Yeah, and, he, you know, he comes from our middle-class background. You know, he didn't grow up as a rich kid. He He worked hard to get where he is. He deserves to be where he is. Um, he's fun to be around on the set. You know, he's, he jokes around a lot on the set. Um, I don't know if I know there's some gag reel material on YouTube if uh, if people want to see that. And it's funny and it's funny to us because we're of course standing there for eight hours a day. Um, we're about to have our final episode in about three weeks, and our editors are busy cutting a multi-season gag reel, basically, you know, flubs and things uh, from the entire nine years. It's it's going to be a lot of fun to watch, but it's going to be very sad to be there watching it on our last night. Um, Because, you know, the way uh, stages that we rent these stages and they're very expensive. So within about 48 hours, it'll be empty, like just gone. And then in another 48 hours, there'll be a whole different show there shooting their show. So it's a bittersweet moment. Yeah, I, I do enjoy the gag reels. The the ones that are available on YouTube are on Tim's uh, uh, YouTube channel. So uh, right. if anyone's uh, watching and wants to check those out, but yeah, they are quite hilarious, and um, yeah. I do appreciate to see to see I those. Think they're a little bit sanitized. I think uh, the ones that we get to see <laughs> might have some more fun bits and pieces in it, but I think those get taken out for for general broadcast. Yeah, uh, we've got a couple more comments from people. Um, our bad, our bad says Jersey Public Safety Hams love the show. Tim and crew will most certainly live on forever in reruns. Uh, thank you very much for that. MR Rice, thanks you, John, for using Ham Radio and the Last Man Standing TV series. I just hope Tim is active on the ham bands. And uh, from K5YVY, John, thank you for producing a very great show. There were so much good elements to the show. We'll watch reruns for a while to come. So, yeah, thank it's you. definitely impressing on, on people. I appreciate those comments. And um, yeah, we'll be in reruns for years. I just wish we could all stay at the same age because we keep aging. But, of course, once you're on tape, you stay young forever. And I hope that all of your viewers will, will give, at least give us a shot to try to contact us during the special mm-hmm. event. Yeah. It, it's it's um, There are a lot of people working very hard to make this an amazing event and what it really takes is not just us calling cq it's people answering us and, and chatting with them I'm, I'm trying to make it conversational i don't want it to be like hey you're five nine q or z you know I, I would like i've asked our our control operators to have a quick chat you know um there's one uh, station in new york that's actually going to run a last man standing trivia contest during the event um, which I think would be great because I, I sent him some swag, some LMS, you know, shirts and mugs and things. So if you uh, if you want to give a try, um, one of the K6 LMS slash two stations will be having a trivia contest. <laughs> and uh, you may, may come away with a last man standing hat or mug or, or shirt or something. We'll see. So for uh, yeah, so for our viewers, as John mentioned, K6 LMS special event. If you have a look on uh, Facebook, uh, for KA6 LMS, you'll find the group and there'll be plenty of information in the group and, and the video that we played earlier too uh, where you yeah. can find more information on contacting the station. So that's a very important thing. So hopefully everyone has a real go at uh, at doing that. Uh, I was, was going to talk now about the actual uh, systems and the uh, antennas and the radios and everything that you've got on the set and I know that we've got a video lined up for that as well so we might play that sure. first as a bit of a, an introduction uh, to the um, 
to the set. Just uh, bear with me while I mm -hmm. queue that one up. And then we might, we've got a few more photos, which are more sort of behind the scenes ones that you've taken that we can uh, we can show. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that this is the right one. I hope it is. I know I sent you a lot of material, so I apologize. <laughs> no, that's fine. There was one which was a, uh, a compilation video of those using the, um, using the station, um, which is in here bear with me a sec yeah we a lot of um a, a lot of our 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 guys our, our club members but also a lot of podcasters came out to use the station which was great for us because they bring their own audience with them and uh, you know all of them because i know you guys are doing the whole youtube thing and mm. um you know jason was there uh josh was there josh. you know uh, all the ham nation people were there at one point or another I definitely would have been there, but it's a little bit far from the travel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's a ways. It's a ways yeah. to come in. I mean, I had definitely people uh, flew in to use the station, which is amazing. You know, people flew in under their at their own cost and stayed in hotels at their own cost to come in and just and work our station. So I, I, that was great. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, but you're and, a little uh, and in particular, Josh and uh, Jason's uh, channel, uh, that's Ham Radio 2.0 and Ham Radio Crash Course, uh, they've got uh, videos on their respective channels of them operating the station, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is quite... The other one is uh, Rhea um, N2RJ. Mm -hmm. N2RJ. Also yeah. use the station. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I found that video now, so I'll play that. Okay, and sure. And we'll be back shortly. Here is John Amadeo, AA6JA here. I'm one of the producers of the Last Man Standing television series. Some of you may know that on the show, Tim Allen's character, Mike Baxter, is a ham with a fictitious call sign, KA0XTT. Mike, KA0XTT. Just a little shout out. Anybody having a good time here on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Anybody hiding in their basement to avoid their relatives? <laughs> In real life, Tim has his own real call sign. Because of our interest in amateur radio, we've always had radio equipment on the show. A number of crew members are licensed, so of course we hook the radios up to antennas on the roof of the stage. As we enter our ninth and possibly final season, I want to give a shout out to Ham Nation. From the show's beginning, we've enjoyed a special relationship with Ham Nation, starting with Bob and Gordon's visit to our set in season one. Calling CQ 20 meters and listening. Uh, K9EID. Hi, Bob. Boy, fancy meeting you here. Gordo, WB6NOA. What's new, Bob? Go ahead. Hey, Gordo, WB6NOA. This is K9EID. It's nice to hear you. Boy, you sound great. I hope everything is going well and uh, things are good uh, out there in good old California. When we formed our club station, KA6LMS, Amanda and Jeff dropped by as special guest operators to make some contacts. 73 QRZ Kilo Alpha 6 Lima Mike Sierra. Whiskey Uniform 9 Bravo. Whiskey Uniform 9 Bravo, you just pushed me out of my chair. Real strong signal, you're 5 and 9. <laughs> Thank you, you're 5 9 near Phoenix. All right, thanks for Phoenix there, 73 QRZ KA6 LMS. Our club members and special guest operators have made a number of activations from the actual radios on set. Ham Nation co-hosts often check into our weekly activations to lend their support. Yeah, November, Victor, 9, Lima, hey, Laura. Hi, is this Valerie? It is, how you doing? <laughs> Good, I'm looking at your uh, at your card here on the wall. Um, thank you for the contact, you sound great. Yeah, yeah, you guys are really loud here, but I got a 6 over 6 over 6 uh, lobster stack pointed right at your head, so <laughs> you sound good. Uh, keep up the good Tell work. Tell her on a dipole. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're on a dipole here. We especially appreciate Bob's assistance. And if you watch the show, you may see a number of Heil mics in use. Oh, baby, baby, losers is the promised Neverland. Demons breed humans to be super intelligent, because the smarter they are, the more delicious they taste. Of course, in each of our nine seasons, we've had the latest in ICOM gear, thanks to the support of Ray Novak. Uh, the problems I had uh, working uh, HF mobile over. This season, we have an IC7300 side-by-side -side with an IC9700. Over the years, we've had a lot of different Comet antennas on the roof, thanks to Mick Swartnick. Here's our Comet GP6 for 2 meters and 70 centimeters. 
And here's our Comet GP95 for 2 meters, 70 centimeters, and 1.2 gigahertz. This season, we're using a Radio Waves 40 meter, 20 meter fan dipole, thanks to Emmett Hohensee. As we shoot our 21 episodes for season 9, we'll be looking for opportunities to work your station and get you that special KA6 LMS QSL card. So from Last Man Standing to Ham Nation, we say thanks and 7-3. So that sort of gives a, a nice little overview of the, the great station that you've got there. I noticed the two icons. I, I've got a, I'm a proud owner of a 7300 and a 9700 too. They're great rigs. It's a great, and a, what a great pair of things to have because pretty much there's nothing you can't work, especially up to 1.2 gigahertz, which is great. Yeah. Um, do you have a yeah. 1.2 gigahertz repeater uh, within range of your, of your station? We don't have a 1.2 gigahertz repeater, but we have a, a quite a large 1.2 gigahertz uh, group, which actually operates in my local area. Okay. And there's there's up to about I think we I think we're up to about 20 20 to 25 wow. stations within the immediate area. This is in a, a my my city's only about 250,000, so. Yeah. Um, and there's, oh, there's, I'm not sure how many hams are here local, but uh, yeah, we've got quite a good uh, a 1.2 gig. Uh, so you work simplex on, on 1.2? Yeah, so we do it on uh, single sideband or FM, mm -hmm. ma mainly FM because uh, those that have uh, handhelds and things that sure. do 1.2 gig. Oh, that's they cool. Can join yeah. in. It's not, yeah, you know, have... it's, it's a tough band. It's not a, not a lot of people have it. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of, uh, we have quite a big microwave representation. Uh, mm -hmm. where we are so uh, microwaves are, are, qu are quite fun and of course 1.2 yeah. gigahertz being sort of the entry level to that um, is is uh, is quite popular so yeah. and yeah the 9700s is a quite a, a popular radio around here so everyone runs those and yeah it's good fun yeah it's a great radio we have a lot of fun playing with them we actually have a the reason why it's actually quite popular here is we have a mountain that looks over our city here mm -hmm. and it's got um, quite a, a sh uh, a steep cliff face which you can actually use to bounce your signal off yeah. of so two stations that may not be able to be in simplex range normally can bounce their signal off of the use it as a passive reflector wow. type of oh, thing. that's very and, cool uh, <laughs> yeah we do uh, little experiments like that so it's a, course, a little bit closer than moon bounce but it's the same basic principle that's right. It, it it varies a little bit too, depending on the uh, the time of day and uh, the the season as well. Sometimes you'll see the signal, the QSB, will be up and down really, 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 really quickly, uh, depending on like if trees are moving or if it's raining yeah. or whatever the case is. So, That's very funny. yeah, um, yeah. So the station there, we've I've got some uh, photos that you sent through. So and thank you again for all of the um, the. Uh, the wonderful material that you sent through. So we might share some of those sure. photos and then yeah. you can explain uh, uh, them in a little bit yeah. more detail. We have nine years uh, worth of photos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've got uh, this first one. These are the antennas on the roof? This is the stage roof and this is the... Um, actually, I think this is last season. Um, we started this out with uh, a lot of Comet antennas, um, the H422, if your viewers know that, and this is not that antenna. And before the studio lot, you can see in this image that there's a lot of solar panels up there. You will certainly see them. And there are two very large, at the center of this picture, two very large, um, uh, what are they called? Um, they, they Inverters, I guess. Yeah. Um, so. Originally, I had these large aluminum antennas on the roof, but when the studio put the solar panels on the roof, I got really nervous about having a lot of metal above the solar panels because these are industrial solar panels. They're very expensive. If one of my antennas came down and broke a solar panel, it would have cost a lot of money to replace them. We're sort of there by the grace of the neglect of the studio. You know, We have access to the roof, and no one ever told us we couldn't go up there, so we put these antennas up. These are mostly wire antennas, except for the UHF, VHF, Comet antennas. But the wire antennas are mostly radio waves, dipoles. And I think you're looking at um, on the left are 40 meter and on the right are 20 meter uh, dipoles. And that's what the station uses. We, uh, we can't run power because we would set off all the smoke detectors in the studio, which would be a very unpopular thing to do. <laughs> and, um, and we really can't put up anything too much more substantial than dipoles just because it needs to be safe up there. And, you know, Cal Southern California has a lot of very high winds and um, 
everything needs to be secure. So when you see an antenna up there, two of those things are radials. Everything else is guide ropes, you know, just mm -hmm. to try to knock it, uh, lock it in so it doesn't go anywhere. Even so, we've lost uh, antennas. These are all fiberglass masts, and we've had masts snap. We've had, uh, you know, if a guy, guy rope comes loose, the whole thing tumbles down, and we're, we're a little nervous when it's windy here. But that's, that's not a bad location. You can see the Hollywood Hills actually are in the background of this picture. Yep. Uh, so this one <laughs> is now this this is an interesting story because I received this photo uh, well probably twelve to eighteen months ago from you and you were talking to me about the the noise on the set and how bad it is, um, especially yeah. for HF operation. It must be quite a challenge. It is um, probably the first six seasons was not too bad. Um, we were still dealing with mostly incandescent lighting. Um, the studio, of course, runs a lot of Wi-Fi, and a, a, there's a lot of signal on a studio lot. There's all kinds of wireless transmissions of audio and video and data. Um, but this, uh, the, the stage, the actual studio you're in, these are all um, Faraday boxes. Though they, the, the walls are lined with a with a fine metal mesh that's grounded to help with that. But the combination of the lighting equipment and the Wi-Fi and all of the various internet things combine to make a lot of RFI, as you can imagine. Um, it, it got a lot worse in the in the last two years because they went to, these are actually all LEDs, and with the LEDs are much noisier than the original lighting systems we had. And it's also as this, this studio is quite old, so it was wired for the internet, you know, probably 30 years ago, 20 years ago at least. So it's using like Cat5 cable and the switches and routers are all old. And as the time went on and they increased, progressively increased the internet speed. So now they're trying to push, you know, megabit ethernet through cat five cable and it's just very leaky and noisy. So the last two years, it's been very, very difficult. Um, one of our, our principal operators of the KA6LMS station is Rob, AA6RA. And Rob is really good at it. And we, we take our, last year we had a 7610 and this year we have the 7300. And we just open up the band scope all the way to a very fine degree so we can just find one little notch, you know, find one frequency where the noise is a little bit less. So it's an S6 instead of an S10, you know, <laughs> mm. and then uh, we can usually operate on that frequency. Yeah, you're looking at what we have basically miles of these are about an inch thick cables. And this stage runs probably 300 amps when we're shooting to run all the lighting equipment. So, you know, I've had hams, well-meaning hams will often tell me that I should employ ferrite beads to help reduce the noise level. But I, I, you'd need ferrite beads the size of snow tires mm. to, to make a dent in this stuff. And then we also run control cables to all the lights. So it's not just Ethernet, but it's, it's an actually older version of an Ethernet running these lighting systems. So there's just so much opportunity for RF. Uh, in this location, it's it's sort of amazing we were able to work anybody from the station. I'll just skip across a couple of sure. these photos. Yeah, There's some more ahead. there outside, but I just wanted to highlight. So that's the I think that's the current draw on each yeah. of your faces. And this is with the the studio dark. This is not in operation. <laughs> it's three phase power, and you can see that um, two of the phases are just idling, and the third phase is, must have some lights running. But ordinarily, we'll be running. You know. In, hundreds of amps through this stage and um, uh, from a voltage perspective this is great you see some of the lighting equipment these are all the sets on the stage um, you know I it, like like all hams we I've run filters and chokes and um, we've shielded as much as we can shield and I'm running the best cable I could find up to the roof to try to isolate the antennas but there's there's interference no matter where you are in the lot. It's not just our stage. I have a, an SDR play in my office, and I see the same interference in my office that we see on the stage. So it's it's everywhere, you know. You know, I, you, you, you look at that and you know you're going to get some RFI problems. <laughs> yeah, just looking at that is a is a ham's worst nightmare. I think. Exactly. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you've you've done very well to uh, to operate the set from uh, or to operate yeah. on the set, considering the amount of noise. Uh, we've got another photo of the yeah. the outside, and we can see those solar panels and those inverters and some yeah. of the view. It's quite a nice view from up there. That's it's you, it's beautiful. Right. As a matter of fact, the the so that's looking toward the north, and um, 
those mountains, you can actually see most of the local repeaters while standing on the stage roof. And the other club that I belong to and that is a part of this, this um, event is the Papa System. And the Papa System is a very large repeater club in Los Angeles. We have pretty much handheld radio coverage in all of Southern California because of the Papa System. They, I, I, I lost count at 22 repeaters and um, they're now running, of course, FM and D-Star was their first digital mode, but now they're running DMR and P25 and the ASU System Fusion. So you can really pick up almost any radio in Southern California and get into the Papa system. And then once you're in it, you can go anywhere in Southern California. So yeah, that's a, a nice, it, uh, what's odd about this picture is that there are clouds and there are generally never clouds in Southern California, which is hard to believe I know, but it's true. Yeah, you don't get uh, that much rain. I, I do know that from no, <laughs> the um, you you mentioned about the the repeater system. That is something that does uh, interest me quite a lot because I'm a repeater builder and I've built a, a a largely scaled down version of what it sounds like uh, your repeater system is over there. Obviously, we don't have sort of the population or the <clears> the um, the uh, the coverage needed, but I think our repeater system now consists of I think th uh, four or five repeaters all linked together uh, to to across our state and and uh, yeah, it's something that requires a lot of time to maintain, a lot of uh, technical knowledge as well, and it's great that uh, you've got yeah. you've got a handheld coverage across a, a city such as Los Angeles is quite amazing. Yeah, well, we can go. You can go from uh, your viewers may not know the references, but from Palm Springs, which is quite a ways away from Los Angeles, up to uh, Santa Barbara, and all the way down to the Mexican border and to the mm. you know, center of um, above the San Fernando Valley. So it's it's a, just a very large area. It's almost it, and it's sort of like cell phone quality coverage, but they have mm. so many repeaters, mm. and they're all interlinked, and you know. Um, in fact, you know, th that's a that's another destination for your viewers because the Papa system holds nets on all of these digital modes and you, you they're on uh, PAPASYS, papasys.com and everyone's welcome to join those nets so you can get into these nets. So they have a regular Monday night DMR net, Tuesday and Thursday uh, D Star nights. They do have Echo Link and uh, so, you know, I, I encourage people to, to check in there. And it's a very knowledgeable group, you can imagine, having built this system. Um, so they're there to answer questions and, uh, and help other people with their, their radio problems. So kind of a fun group. A comment from uh, MR Rice. Have you looked into using remote ham stations to help on the noise floor problem? Something to think about on future TV series using <laughs> ham radio. Well, that was what uh, you originally um, uh, um, come to me about was because mm -hmm. I think you wanted to see if you could operate from your office because it was slightly quieter and using a, right. a 440 megahertz link across to the to the set. Yeah, but, um, <clears throat> I was I was yeah. originally thinking we well, by the way. So the answer to that question is yes, we've certainly looked into it. Uh, I, I'm I'm at home right now and, and sitting in front of me is an IC 7610, which is very easy to put on the on the Internet mm -hmm. since it's got its own Ethernet connection mm -hmm. and its own sound Same card built in. The, uh, yeah, the 9700 is the same, mm -hmm. and uh, to a lesser extent, the 7300 as well. Yeah, and so, I mean, I had thought at some point maybe just run remote software from the stage. So technically, we would be on the stage, and then we would really be just using my radio at home where I have a little bit better antenna system and certainly a lot more power. <laughs> mm. um, but then, you know, it's like part of the fun of calling the station is actually talking to the radios and a person that's sitting at that desk right behind you. So it wouldn't be quite the same thing. Um, mm. So we didn't really, we didn't, we didn't explore it. And then this season, because really no one's allowed on the stage because of COVID, we I sort of dropped the, uh, the, the mission as it were to, to try to do that. Um, originally I was trying to create a, an audio link from my office and because my office actually receives better than the stage because I have less RFI. And I was thinking, why don't I pick up, of course, why wouldn't you have a ham radio in your office? I had one in mine. So I was thinking of taking the receive signal out of my radio in my office. I think we've got a, is that, she, there, think that is my bungalow right there. In yeah. fact, you can kind of see right behind the door, there's a there's an antenna. That's a 20 meter, 40 meter fan dipole. So I was thinking of taking that signal and shooting it to the stage on some kind of a link and having the 9700, I could have done it on, 
you know, two meters or 70 or um, 1.2. But I, I really haven't found a transmitter that I could use, like a turn on for an hour or in excess of an hour without it timing out or overheating or catching on fire. So uh, yeah. we decided not to do that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we've got a couple more comments. Uh, Chip, uh, who is a <laughs> channel member, a crazy man of cables. Yes, they were uh, KD9. OQI is his call sign. Uh, MR Rice also asked, will KA6 LMS be using Echolink on the special event station? Yes, and, uh, they, they, they will. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, I encourage you to, uh, to it's the, uh, the website is www.gsbarc.org slash LMS. And you really need to go there because it updates all the time. And I, I, I had to apologize today to Hedden because in just in today, I think I sent out three versions of of videos that of the video that you played at the beginning of the show because as i'm sitting there uh, outputting the video i'm getting new information in fact even after i put out that information i got more information about other events there are so many events almost events inside events um you know because what does a clean sweep mean when you, we've got uh, four of six special event stations and uh, an operator in every call sign area, you know, so what do you try to do? Do you work all the, do you work all the call sign areas? Do you try to work the stage? Do you try to work the bonus stations? Well, the answer is you work whatever, you know, whatever you want to work, you know, whatever combination you think would be cool for yourself. But uh, on the digital modes, you, you know, try to work us on, on many modes. If you, let's, you've got a D star radio and a, and a, an echo link, work us on both, you know, um, um, it's, it's funny. I know the amateur logic guys, do the sound check they do a sound check every week and the goal there is to see how many modes you can check in and sometimes people will check in on seven different digital modes mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing um i think i could maybe scrape together three <laughs> if i had yeah. to <laughs> but so, so we've yeah. got a couple more photos of the lights uh here's the uh i guess the noise on the 7300 yeah. so uh yeah quite quite broadband and yeah that's more like what it looks like in my office that's on a on an sdr play in my office so as you run across those those bars you hear you know quite a lot of noise and each and there's so so it's that that we think that was a router putting out that noise mm. so you can kind of see the challenge we had but as i said rob who's really good at it will open that band scope and, and uh, you know you can see that there are areas where there's slightly less noise so yeah. you just got to move along the band, find the spot with the least amount of noise, and then publish that frequency. That's where we are tonight. And, uh, you know, there are nights when we've made in excess of 100 contacts in one hour from the stage. Mm. And there are nights when we made 10 or 20. <laughs> so yeah. it just depends yeah, on the night. Is. A couple more photos from the outside. One that is here is the, uh, I think <clears throat> this is a, an earlier season uh, yes. photo. There's the QSL cards in the background and the yeah. other gear on the desk. Uh, this this was in Mike Baxter's yeah this um, may be the basement office. oh this is oh, the right. office yeah and this was probably a few years ago I think that's a is that a 7850 maybe and it's hard to keep track of we have had one of every ICOM radio we started with a 9100 because it had D-Star in it and then we sort of quickly pro progressed through 7600s and 7800s 7850s then into the SDRs, the 7610s and the 7300. So you almost have to like, there. that's uh, the beginning of a season when the boxes would arrive. <laughs> it's, um, you know, we, we don't have a budget for amateur radio. Uh, we're a TV show. We're not a show about ham radio. So hmm. the manufacturers have been very good to us, particularly Ray Novak at ICOM, who, you know, we would never be doing this without his help and the help of people like, you know, um, Mick at, at Comet and Emmett at, at uh, Radio Waves and, uh, you know, other all these uh, other manufacturers, you're looking at LDG and you're looking at Array Solutions and Green Heron and, you know, so the manufacturers have really come out to support us. And at the end of the season, sorry to say, we send it all back. <laughs> mm. I'll be packing no. up the radios in a few weeks and sending them all back. So <laughs> it's, it's good. The, uh, I, I think that the, the support that you've received from the ham radio manufacturers and the community has been really great, um, yeah. across the entire, uh, entire shows run. So, um, yeah, especially ICOM and, uh, it's such mm -hmm. great gear too. And, and even it's, it's also had that visual appeal as well, uh, on, on, uh, on camera. 
So I know yeah. uh, in one of in one of the episodes where I think it might have been the Thanksgiving episode where Tim's downstairs uh, talking on the radio and you can see the you can actually see the S meter moving and and all that sort of thing. It's uh, uh, everyone would have uh, uh, really enjoyed that. So yeah, Whenever, well now of course for the for the the hardcore um, amateurs when we were using radios where anyone transmitted on camera while the show was being written, um, we were going into dummy loads, of course. So yep. we weren't really, as we, people would say, well, you're transmitting illegally. And well, no, we really weren't. We were into dummy loads. But when the hams got on the radio and we have obviously a number of licensed hams, then we can transmit for real into antennas. So. Yeah. And we've got a photo there of uh, some, I guess, are these uh, uh, crew members? Are they? These are all crew members. Yeah, this yep. was, um, this might have been the very first VE session that we did. Um, we did three, uh, actually four. Um, the first three were all crew members, and we, we had about the same size group each time. And then uh, the, the final VE session that we did a couple of years ago was the one we did for Jet and Jet and his dad and uh, Sophie, one of our production assistants that all got their licenses. And then, uh, and then COVID hit, so <laughs> we haven't done one since, but uh, we'll see. I like the, the funny comment was for the other, other shows that in the future that incorporate ham radio. I don't know, that's, that's a tough one. It's a tough one to, this show just, it, it kind of happened organically that we were able to put ham radio. Most shows you really can't put ham radio in. <laughs> we do have, sorry for the quick scrolling, but we do okay. have a, there we go. We've got a photo of Jet yeah. out the front of the, yeah. out the front of the uh, the set using his ID fifty one. To, uh, to probably, probably the most just, active ham on the on the show and on probably in our, in probably club. just before his battery is about to uh, go, <laughs> to go flat in that photo. I'm telling so. you that that was the funniest thing. I finally uh, got him a high capacity battery, and and uh, you know we gifted him a high capacity battery because uh, he just went through the, those little batteries so quickly. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things I might just do before we wrap up, we've uh, been going for an hour and ten minutes, and I do really appreciate your time and realise that uh, that you are taking a, a Friday afternoon out as well uh, from whatever uh, you uh, might have been doing. But I just did want to share quickly some uh, some of the QSL cards that you did have uh, that you sent through uh, on the shows uh, that you've used on the show and bear sure. me again because some of these are. A little bit different. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Um, I think that should work. Yep. So we've got this is the spe this is a special event uh, station QSL card that uh, I guess is available for those who work the station over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, <laughs> this one seems interesting. Uh, K6H. Well, we had. We had two events called K6H, and they were Hollywood uh, ham radio celebrating Hollywood. And um, this was the second of the two. And because at the time, I think Sharknado was a big deal, so we made Hamnado, and uh, it was basically ham radio destroying Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jet's uh, QSL card there. That uh, seems like an early. Yeah, he's he's certainly grown up a lot. Uh, that's, oh, that sounds like an. And an, an now he's like a young adult, basically. Yeah. Another K6H one yeah. replacing the Hollywood sign, I noticed. Um, yeah, that was the very first K6H we did, which we put eight stations on the set. Each set, each, you know, uh, Mike's office, the living room, the kitchen, each had its own ham radio station. So like 10 meters, 20 meters, you know, 40 meters. And then we did D-Star and uh, Echo Link at the same time. So we had a lot of hams. It was like a field day inside our stage. Kind of fun. There's the uh, and that's a D yeah D Star QSL card. Um, oh, that's a movie. Uh, FT8. Yeah. Um, uh, will you be doing FT8? You'll be doing FT8 for the special event station we, we will as be. well. Yeah, yeah. Joe Eisenberg, if you know, is the uh, the kit building editor of CQ Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, he will be doing FT8 from his home in Nebraska. And he actually came to the show and did FT8 from our stage, and that would be the QSL card you received if you worked Joe during his uh, activation of the set. Yep. Uh, and I guess that's another one. Of yeah, the... That's, the, that's the regular QSL card. Yep. So this is uh, the fictional call sign for, for Kyle on the show when he that's was using correct. the radio in that episode. Um, right. Talking to Mandy. 
mm-hmm. it was KF0XIE, Foxy. Yep. Um, we've also got uh, that's a, an actual photo as well. Yeah. Um, uh, the logos. There was one here. Oh, so we'll just go back. So this is this is my background. So this is mm-hmm. uh, season nine's um, Mike Baxter's office. That's right. Um, so uh, just a little setup there, and then this is his home station, I guess. Um, uh, this is actually season, I think, six. It's the same. Oh, okay. yep. Yeah, because you can see the QSL cars in the yep. background and a different radio and a lot more gear. And of course, uh, Mike's um, uh, call sign in the show is KA0XTT, and I believe the XTT at the end was for X Tool Time or X Tim Taylor. Taylor. Yeah, yep. Tim Taylor. Yeah, formerly Tim Taylor. Yep. And actually, we'd like to think of Tim's real call sign is uh, KK6OTD. And of course, the the funny story is that people for for a very long time well we would say well tim allen has a ham radio license and they would say well i he doesn't because i looked him up on qrz and i looked him up on mm. the fcc database and of course that's his stage name and his real name is timothy dick mm. so his call sign ott we would say is originally timothy dick so yeah and then when people finally someone realized oh wait that's not his legal name so then they looked him up so he does have a does have a ham radio license <laughs> yeah and uh, I think the last one there was uh, was Ed's uh, WB0ASQ, which I think is, uh, yeah. I'm, I, I think from memory, the line in that show was uh, Kyle was talking to him on the radio and, and Ed was in the Amazon and asked him how his Amazon gift card was going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, he yeah. said, Not that kind of Amazon. <laughs> that, it's, I mean, for me, that is probably the, the, the quintessential ham radio episode. Um, it's, it's very funny. Um, and it's actually lengthy. It's there's a lot of ham radio on air, people talking to each other on radios in that episode. Um, so that's a good one to seek out in the reruns. Yeah, and I think it's it's great that your that your writers were able to work that into the show and mm-hmm. and and get it get it working. And and yeah, it's been a great exposure to to ham radio to because I, I can I can think of maybe uh, a. A handful of references maybe to ham radio on TV shows over the years uh, one of them one of the earlier ones that I can remember is uh, if you remember the Munsters uh, <laughs> yes. Her- Herman Munster yeah. was using a ham radio on that uh, when was that probably back in the 60s oh yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Home Improvement actually had a, a very vague ham radio reference in one of their episodes as well um, you know I'm not so, familiar with that I'll have to go check that out that one is uh, an episode where um, the uh, where Mark Taylor uh, at the time was um, trying to impress a girl, and the girl at the time was uh, was um, after a certain type of of, of guy, and and uh, he uh, and Mark comes home and says, "Oh, she dumped me for a ham ra- for a guy who's got a ham radio club." <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a, that's a that's a little little reference that probably that's not funny. too many people know but as a as a mad home improvement nut I should uh, <laughs> I know that um, some of the other shows obviously you see in a lot of movies and um, mm-hmm. and uh, some TV shows as well but mainly movies they'll be yeah. using ham radios but they'll be using them as some sort of you know emergency communication or yeah. some way of communicating to another actor or or character but they don't mention that it's ham radio it's not the same as what you've done on last man standing right. so i think you've done a, a a fantastic job so well thanks our, i mean our goal was mostly to just make it po- at least neutral or positive and or nothing uh, not to make fun of ham radio and mostly to just make it accurate this is really what it is not it's not cb and it's not a a cardboard box with blinking lights in it or you know like so many tv shows would do well, um, thank you, John, for joining me. This uh, well for your afternoon. I really do appreciate it. it's Friday afternoon for you there. You probably, uh, I think you've come from the from the set or you've come from the show um, uh, from work. So I appreciate you taking the time out to to join us and to to speak about the show and all sorts of things. Um, don't forget everyone who's watching to check out uh, KA Six LMS um, on Facebook and also the GSBARC website for the. Uh, activation that's coming up in a couple of weeks for the uh, end of the show and I think that this comment from AW uh, sums it up quite nicely we're going to miss all of you and one of the finest shows ever produced so I think uh, I don't think we can um, 
we can uh, sum it up any better than that. So thank you, John, for joining me on the show and, uh, and good luck with the future and for the end of the show coming up. Well, thanks for having me. I hope to hear you on the air. I, I hope to work you. I, I'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely try. Uh, we'll see how we go. I'll, I'll probably uh, have a a bit more of a shot with maybe FT8, but uh, I, I would like to try HF. But if not, yeah. I'll jump on the Echo Link or something like that. All righty, great. I look forward we'll to see it. See how we go, or D Star. Thank you, John, uh, for joining me. Thank you.